attending the Baba along with other students yes in his room yes and my heart goes out to just tell people hey listen if you want to really know about Sai Baba then come to us you know come to me mm -hmm. ask me I watched him <laughs> 24 into 7 365 days a year I was a teenager I was struggling to find faith and I found faith by watching him not by reading a book not because Vibhuti materialized in some photograph that would have scared the heck out of me probably but this was I noticed I saw what Baba was um, for me, it was different because I think from the time I was born, thanks to my grandma, our family was already into Swami. And um, she was the Brindavan singer, so she got my mom into Swami, and that's how, you know, as kids, we, we always knew Swami. His entire life, the way I saw it, was a saga of sacrifice. You know, he was doing it, it's all for his devotee's sake. He had a huge veranda where he could go out for a walk and get some fresh air. He wouldn't do that because devotees would come and watch him. So in his own room, in his own house, he lived like a prisoner. And yet, there was a sense of incredible freedom, peace in his face, in his presence. And to me, that, I was saying, where is that secret? What is that secret that he's... He's not bound by these four walls. I could go crazy. You could give me $10 million and tell me to do this. I, would, I couldn't do it. I would go mad. And August 18th, he gave my parents and um, Sundar's mom an interview and finalized the wedding. And then he sat with a calendar and said, oh, let's look at the date. And he said, um, first he said September 3rd. And then he said, no, it's a, it's a Thursday. It's a working day, you know. Uh, it won't work out. And then he said, September 6th is a Sunday, so let's do it on September 6th. And, and he and that's married how, the two of you. He married the two of us in the interview room. But he would get up at 4 in the morning. He would not put on his own bedroom light. He would use a flashlight. Why? Because you'd say, if I put on the light, the devotees across in the West Prashanti, they're all waiting for Baba's room light. And they're crazy people. They won't sleep. Then they will mm -hmm. all be up at 3 o'clock, and they'll be waiting to get a glimpse of my mm -hmm. hair, my face, why should I trouble them? Why should I trouble them? He would say, I, will, I can take care of my job with my flashlight. Why do I need a big light? <laughs> so in his own room, in his own house, he would use a flashlight to go to the restroom in the morning, have his shower, come out. We were sitting in Darshan. We had gone from the, you know, the hospital staff. We were sitting and suddenly um, Swami came out and there was this girl. It was her birthday, one of the girls. And, so she stood up with her tray of candy and Swami looked at her and he says, are you Maya? <laughs> and she looked and she says, uh, no Swami, I am, and she told her name and um, <laughs> then he looked around, of course he blessed her and took her candy and then he looks and he says, where's Maya? <laughs> and I was scared, I said, what did I do, why is he asking for me? Because he's never done that before, right? So. All day long, what does he do? I mean, I used to often wonder, what does he do sitting there, reading mm -hmm. the devotee's mail? He does that. You know? Oh, that's all he did. That was his pastime, opening, reading, opening, reading. So I stood up, I was like in the third or fourth row, and I stood up and I said, Swami, I'm Maya. And then he looks at me and he says, Oh, marriage mangta hai. Which means marriage you want to get married? <laughs> Here's the first um, um, lesson I learned. Never open your mouth and speak to Swami unless you're spoken to. <laughs> so even though we say we were in his room and we were, oh yeah, we were two years, none of us and no one I knew could ever say, oh yeah, I can put in a word for Baba for you. Nobody. Mm -hmm. So we went there to see Swami and uh, he called my parents and my grandparents in for an interview. And my parents were not sure if children are allowed, so we were left outside, um, you know, with one of the ladies there. So as he was talking to my parents, he looked and he said, where are the children? And then my mother said, they're sitting out. So he said, no, bring them. So my sister and I were brought in and um, he looked at my sister and then he said, oh, what's your name? So she said, Shalini. And he said, oh, good girl, and patted her cheek and, you know, hugged her. And then he looked at me and said, what's your name? And I looked at him and said, as if you don't know. Because <laughs> all my life I'd been hearing that he knows everything. Right? So you were so being smart with Baba? I was being smart with him. <laughs> I haven't been to Puttaparthi for 15 years, not as Maya. 
The desire has not come for two reasons. One, and both are very personal. One being that I have not felt the need because why do I need to go when I, when you experience His divinity in everything that we do, the birds chirping, the plants, the trees, the good and the bad. It's, it's amazing how you, when you open yourself and allow divinity to express itself within from within, it's, the proximity is so mind-blowing that you feel going there is just something uh, you don't want to. The other reason why I really don't want to go is I can't see Swami in a wheelchair. I'm not seen in that way. <laughs>
I saw the saffron robe, but I just couldn't put two and two together. There's no way a saint can, you know, get along in India sitting on a throne and driving in a car, right? <laughs> because he'll be immediately branded as, oh, this is no saint at all. But when I kept getting pictures after pictures and coloring just orange and black and <laughs> skin color all the time, I said, do you have any other pictures at all? So who is this guy? And that's when Sai Dutta opened up. He was very quiet. He was very patient. He didn't, never forced Sai Baba on me. But he said, this is a holy man. I said, really? He seems to be a really rich man, <laughs> rich holy man. He's got silk robes. There's not a hole in his robe. And he is surrounded by all these people. So that's how the, the first experience of Sai Baba, uh, the first time I actually heard about him. Uh, I was not interested at all. I said, oh, okay, if he's a holy man, forget it. Don't even bother explaining to me. He said, no, this is your kind of holy man. I said, what do you mean? Because by then he knew what I was, you know, up, I, I used to use him as my mentor and tell him all my woes and all my, how people don't ex explain concepts of God or religion and things like that. Um, and he gave me the summer showers in Vrindavan. This guy was an established Baba devotee. I oh guess. yes, he was a photographer, mm -hmm. Sai Baba's photographer. Oh, he was Baba's photographer. Yeah, he was Baba's photographer. Well, he wasn't just a commercial photographer. Oh no, no, no. He, his family, his father was with Shirdi Baba. I didn't hear his that. His father part and his story. grandfather were with Shirdi Sai Baba. So he they was have... just waiting for you for the nut to crack, so he could yes. give you his yes. wisdom and insight. Yes, especially because my father got transferred at that time to to a distant remote village from Bombay, he got transferred to Haryana, which is a very distant place of Delhi, to a village. There were no colleges there. And I had just, I was going to finish my 12th grade and enter into college. So he, so, he began then to speak, to a, a spoon feed you information at a level that you found acceptable about this man whose picture you were coloring in? Well, he didn't speak anything about him. He just said, hey, so I, you know, this is, my father's getting transferred, everybody, I need to look for a college somewhere else in India, because I can't continue to live in Bombay. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling him all this, he said, you know what, there is a college, this guy's college is just going to open in Puttaparthi. So if you want, you can go. I said, no, no, no holy man, no holy colleges. So that's when he gave me this book. He said, listen, just read this book. And then you make up your mind. And they were all Baba's sayings and the discourses. And the summer course in Brindavan was a great discourse of Baba. And, and, you know, I was expecting him to talk about the usual things, you know, the God with four hands and spears. And, and always, I was always turned, out, uh, turned off by our, all our gods had weapons in their hands and I could never understand why. Anyway, um, summer showers in Brindavan was simple. I opened this book and I, he's saying God is love. That's it. That's what I always believed. <laughs> serve the people. That's it. That's what I want to hear. And so that's how it started. I was like, oh, this guy speaks sense. And so the little miracles that you know, the Sai Dutta was trying to tell me, I thought he's going to talk about how he's performing miracles or how he's able to do not, none of what he was doing. It was all about you are God too. Everybody is mm -hmm. God. Everybody is divine. Uh, love is God. God is love. Things which made so much sense. And I said, how come I never came across this before? So that was suddenly it was like a a door opening, uh, like a floodgates opening. I so, often think about that moment mm -hmm. in my life as to how I was so cynical about it and what changed me. I can never understand what and changed Baba me. And Baba might say that you, Sundar Iyer, waited lifetimes for that particular moment. And now I, I believe that. Yeah. And how long was it after that moment dawned on you that you decided to commit yourself to uh, make an application to attend Baba's university? Well, I. And then I started reading Baba's books. I attended his summer course in Vrindavan. And because my father said, go there, try it for a month, and see if you like it. Even because though you, your father was opposed to this for the outset. Well, he was. But at that point, he was in Haryana. He needed a college for me. So this turned out to be a place where nobody smokes and drinks and no parties. So he said, OK, at least this guy will be sane. If not, if anything, he can at least focus on his studies. So he was kind of he was more, more interested in the fact that it was a protected environment. Mm -hmm. Um, so he said, go check out the summer course uh, and see if you can, if you like the place and then let me know and, and if your marks are good, you can get it. So I did go attend the summer course and, and, you know, every moment I saw Baba, I was getting more and more interested in him. Uh, I, I saw people falling at his feet. I saw people, you know, when, once you're in Brindavan and you hear so many stories, um, none of them was seriously... Um, it didn't move me. I was more curious at that point, more willing to learn before I finally said, Baba, 
I am surrendering to you or you are my guru. It took a long time for me to say did, that. Did he give you any personal attention during those early days when you were attending these courses? The summer course in Vrindavan, he gave a group interview to every state, uh, young students from every state who attended, and I was part of that group. So that was as close as, as I got at that time, and I was more sitting behind and watching what he does and you know, how he's talking, and I was body reading, and sign reading, just to make sure <laughs> that I was on the right track. <laughs> so I think it was a, not just but a short time thereafter that the opportunity and your willingness met and you decided yes. to attend? The, the first time, uh, the turning point came when my, my grades were out, my 12th standard grades were out, because I decided to join Puttaparthi because every time Baba spoke, I said he makes a lot of sense, he makes so much sense, I need to more, know more about this person. He is so down to earth, so simple, and yet people are talking such great things about him. Who is this uh, personality? So um, I was very curious that I joined this college. So Puttaparthi, I moved to Puttaparthi from Brindavan, waited for my grades to come. I was told you need uh, an A grade to get into the commerce, the BCom, the Bachelor's in Commerce in India is called the BCom. Bachelor's in Science is BSc and mm -hmm. Bachelor's in Arts is BA. So I, my father had clearly specifically said, you are only getting your admission in Commerce. So I'm an accountant. A business man. No, I'm an accountant, so you are also going to be an accountant, period. My fate was seen. I cannot see Sundar here as an accountant, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, he said, you have to get into Commerce and I needed A grade. My grades came out and I was low, lower than B grade, a little higher than C grade probably, but lower than B grade. I was nowhere close to an A grade and I knew there was no way I could get into this admission. And so, long story short, my father sends me the return ticket to come back to Bombay and he says, I have to deal with you now and put you in some college somewhere. You're not going to get into <laughs> Baba's college because the college had opened, it was a week later and I had my return tickets booked. So two days before I left Puttaparthi, I wrote a very strong letter to Baba, a very angry letter. And I said, Baba, I, for once I was interested in God and spirituality, and I thought you made sense. I've never prayed to you before. This is the first time I'm going to pray to you. If for some reason, if you think my life can change, then I need admission. I don't know how you can give me this admission but I don't think it's happening. Now I have only two days left, the college has started, and I wrote all this, whatever I felt I wrote, and towards the end I said, the moment you take this letter, your relation and my relation is cut. I don't believe you're God, and I don't think you're divine. <laughs> These things just don't work. You were angry. I was very angry. I was a young Bombay blood. <laughs> so I, I thought, I'm not going to sneak out of the ashram, I'm going to let him know, look into his face and say, here, take it, you know, bye. <laughs> I was so prepared for it. I went and sat first in the darshan with just a day left. I'm sitting with the letter in my hand with my palms folded, because that was, you know, mm -hmm. and the and the envelope, and I wanted to give it to him, look into his eyes. So he comes to darshan, and he comes, his fingers like this on the letter. He holds the envelope like this, and he says, kya hai? What is it? The first time he spoke to me, literally. And I was like, Baba, admission, Baba, admission. And I heard my father's voice from inside, be calm, make it clear what admission. So I said, Swami, be calm, be calm. And Swami said, what, be calm? Be calm, be calm. You remember him saying that? Oh my gosh, everybody was laughing. And I was excited because he spoke to me. He didn't take that letter. His hand was like this, and then he took it away and walked off. And in the letter, later when I opened two days later and read that letter again, I was feeling very ashamed of what I read. But when I read in the end, I said, the moment you take this letter, my relationship is going to break. So he, it's almost like, okay, do I cut the relationship or not? So he came like this, held my en held the envelope like this because he would pull it off from my hand, right? He used to always take it like this. Kya hai? Swami, be calm, be calm. Be calm, be calm. And he looked at the principal and I think he made some gesture and walked away. And so the darshan gets over and then I saw the principal of the college walking towards me and I ran to him because I've been running to him every day. And he knew this is a, a pain guy coming to me every day, sir, please, sir, please. So today I said, did you see Swami spoke to me? He said, I know. 
I think your prayers are answered. You can come and see me tomorrow. <laughs> you sure I'm going to get BCom? He said, whatever you want, I'll give you. Even with your CCOM average, you C -com. get into BCom. <laughs> I got into BCom. And oh. I think I never had to look back. I'm just, I know oftentimes uh, I, I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and I think, what if, what if um, he had let me go? So, no, that's a beautiful story. We'll get back to part two in just a minute. But right now, I want to hear how Maya got accepted and decided to go to Baba's school. And it wasn't the uh, secondary or the high school, as we say here in America. It was the primary no. school. How did it, that happen? It was the primary school, and I joined there in my eighth grade. Um, for me, it was different because I think from the time I was born, thanks to my grandma, our family was already into Swami. And um, she was the Brindavan singer, so she got my mom into Swami and that's how, you know, as kids we, we always knew Swami. And I should point out the whole and, family's uh, here right now, your grandmother <laughs> and your mother both had a yes, lot to do with that. My mom is there. Yeah, and, and uh, um, well that's not your mother, that's no, Leela. <laughs> there she She's is. behind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, so uh, and, um, was there enthusiasm initially that opened the door for you or did you have an interest as well? Well, um, we did have an interest. Actually, again, it was because my dad was in the Air Force mm -hmm. and the kind of places that he was posted to. Every two years, he, you know, it would be a different place. And as we came to higher grades, my sister was to go into the ninth grade and me into the eighth. Um, the school was not very good. So my parents started looking at different options and then they didn't want us to keep changing schools as we got into the higher grades. Right. And then my grandmother said that, you know, the school is there in Puttaparthi and they were just starting the um, high school that year in 83. So we were the first batch of students for the 8th and 9th grade. And she said, why don't you try that? And she was in Bangalore, so it was, you know, close enough for her to visit us, even if my parents couldn't come. So we went there and we had to, you know, go through the entrance exam. They used to have an entrance exam in math, English and Hindi, three subjects. And I was all excited because I used to read Enid Blyton books as a kid <laughs> and all the stories about dorm life and, you know, hostel living. I, I was excited you about really that. Wanted that. I really wanted that. My sister was not very keen about leaving home and going, but um, I guess her being there was a consolation for me, so mm -hmm. I didn't miss my parents that much. And then, of course, added to it was that this is Swami's school, you know, <laughs> so it was the icing on the cake. So that's how we went there, um, and I joined. So we did three years. I did three years over there, eighth to tenth grade, and then I went into um, the girls' college in Anantapur. But you didn't and, just um, get. Uh, you just didn't join, did you? You also well, had to be uh, selected for. Oh school? yes, we had to. We had to do these entrance exams. And the point, the point and, I'm making um, is that you had sort of a slight advantage nobody else had. In fact, um, some people may even say that you cheated to get in. You sat on Baba's lap as an infant, as a child, didn't you? <laughs> I did when so I was about four years old. For you right there? I guess he had already decided at that time that you know. And real quickly, we're going to come there. What's so. that quick story? How could you meet him at such a young, tender age for yourself? Well, um, we, how old were you? I was, I think, four or five. Okay. And um, yeah, four. So. Um, Every vacation, my parents, you know, would take us to Bangalore to see my grandparents. And then um, that year we were visiting, and I think this was in Bangalore, right? Yeah. So um, we used to, whenever Swami was there, we used to go to Brindavan for the darshans all the time because um, my grandma used to sing there. And that year it was actually in Puttaparthi, not Bangalore. Mm -hmm. So we went there to see Swami, and uh, he called my parents and my grandparents in for an interview. And my parents were not sure if children are allowed, so we were left outside, um, you know, with one of the ladies there. So as he was talking to my parents, he looked and he said, where are the children? And then my mother said, they're sitting out. So he said, no, bring them. So my sister and I were brought in and um, he looked at my sister and then he said, oh, what's your name? So she said, Shalini. And he said, oh, good girl, and patted her cheek and, you know, hugged her. And then he looked at me and said, what's your name? And I looked at him and said, as if you don't know. Because <laughs> all my life I'd been hearing that he knows everything. Right? So you were so, being smart with Baba? I was being smart with him. <laughs> and what did he and then he you? looked and he said, Maya, Jagat Maya, which yeah. means world of Maya. And patted me on the cheek and then he gave us a lot of vibhuti packets and we did namaskaram. So had your that parents was the already told him you're the names of the daughters? No. 
No. <laughs> they hadn't mentioned us at all. He asked where are the children because uh -huh. till then he was talking to them about you know their lives yeah. and all that. You and, must have um, been pretty impressed at the so. age of four that this guru <laughs> I was. teacher who slapped your city and oh, yes. your name. Oh, I loved him <laughs> at and, that age. And, too, and I'm so. invited to ask you also about your first interview with Baba. Is that not at this time but a later time? Um, well, that was the first interview. I don't know. Okay. And the, the other one was um, when um, after after I finished college, mm -hmm. um, my bachelor's degree in '91. That's the year that uh, the hospital, the super speciality hospital in Puttaparthi, was being built right. and inaugurated, the big one. So we were sent letters. We finished in June '91, and um, we received letters from our principal saying that Swami was looking for old students to volunteer at the hospital uh, and if we were interested we could you know go to put a party and see what it was about so of course um, that was a good chance and so my friend and me and a couple of others we went to put a party and um, sat there um, and this was in December of 91 so November the hospital was inaugurated and this was in December and um, so we were about eight girls and Swami called us in for an interview. So that was mm -hmm. um, the second one that I got, if you take the first and one. And I had interrupted you and, and you uh, just got a, uh, just started to talk about your first several years there as a Baba student. Mm -hmm. Did you have much access to Swami at that time? Did he come to the school? Did you have he, a chance? Yes, he used to come to the school, um, especially when there would be, you know, some dignitaries visiting Puttaparthi, he would come to show them the school. So he would walk into the classrooms and we'd be there and the teachers would freeze and he'd say, no, no, keep teaching, <laughs> you know. And of course, nobody would pay attention because Swami's standing there. Um, and then sometimes he would just drive in when it was breakfast time. So he'd just come around the dining hall, we'd all be sitting and, you know, he'll ask, okay, you know, did you eat? Did you have this? Did you have that? And walk around. So Maya, was this but, experience um, everything that you expected it was going to be or was it actually? It was more? a lot more. How so? It was a lot more. I mean, I guess I had no concept of how it's going to be there. You know, I, I was only thinking about the life in the dorm and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but being there, we used to go every Thursday and Sunday for darshan from school every Thursday, Sunday morning and Swami would come and he would, you know, he'd just talk to everybody and then when it's your birthday, you get to sit right up front and give him that tray of, you know, candy and then he throws it and all that excitement and that closeness with him. Um, There's a I question I've often of wondered when I see the students come in. Were you and your sister students all mm -hmm. students at a spiritual school or were you spiritual students at a school? Did you have much of a um, sense of having an interest in spiritual growth at that time? Or was this well, just school for you? Initially, I guess it was just school because, mm -hmm. you know, everything was new. We had to concentrate on the studies part of it and it, it was a good standard. Um, but being there, listening to Swami's discourses, you know, attending every function, going to darshans, brought in the spirituality and I guess that's where we started questioning and learning and exploring more about ourselves and you know and one of the things um, that i've liked over the years is hearing people's personal experiences of swami as a student on the inside and i'll ask Sundar this in a second too did you start to become aware of some of your sister students having personal experiences with baba whether they came in their dreams or performed uh, leelas for them or miracles or materializations yes um in fact a lot of the girls when their parents would visit swami would call them in for interviews you know, as children, and then they would they would tell us a few things that he said, and um, a lot of them would talk about dreams that they've had. We we used to, you know, discuss with each other. We were 13, 14 year olds, so we used to talk about those things. And um, Swami materializing, you know, the little lockets for mm -hmm. some of them, giving that. So um, there were a lot of experiences shared over there, and then the teachers would share their experiences with us too. Um, you know, when they first came to Swami and how different things were at that time. So we learned a lot from them also. And who was and, Sai Baba um, to you at that very early age when you were a young student? To me, he was... Uh, was he more than the principal of the school? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> he was more a friend to me. I would think of him at that, as yeah. that. Um, because I know my parents said God and everything, but I wasn't clear 
you know, as to who God is at that point. And, and one I final question for this part of the interview, and what about your, your the students that you went to class with? Mm -hmm. Did they share your point of view? Were some of them skeptics or doubters, or were some of them really convinced of Well, the there were a couple who were very new to Swami, and they had, um, you know, joined there because of maybe circumstances. Somebody said it's a good school, you know, girls, it's a girls' school, your girls will be safe. It's a good environment. So they came there. They didn't know much about Swami. I wouldn't say anyone was very skeptic at that point. Mm -hmm. um, they were learning about him. Yeah. And so. you had a lot to learn about all the way through those remaining oh, yes. years. A lot. So, Sundar, back over to you. And I've asked about Maya's first interview, including the one at the age of four. I don't suspect you had <laughs> such an experience. <laughs> Tell us about your first <coughs> meeting with Baba <coughs> in an interview form. I, I wish I had a, that interview at the age of four <laughs> now, but um, my first interview with Baba was um, about eight, nine months. Well, I joined in 79. It was in, uh, let's see, 81, mm -hmm. um, a year and a half later. We had, um, just six months before that, we had a hostel inauguration and Baba had attended and I had done some gymnastics um, in front of him. I jumped through three rings of fire. And I, I'll probably mention <laughs> that. That, that would get his attention. <laughs> yes, it did. And I, I'll pr probably come to that incident in a bit because that explains the spontaneity of Baba's love. For me, it was all first hand. I never, for me, if somebody says, you know, Swami is love, it, I could never understand that till I had that experience and I'll come to that in a bit mm -hmm. if you have the time. Yep. But the interview was when he finally called me, he cornered me straight away into a ball and he said, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I said, Swami, I don't want anything because I had never, uh, and today, even today, asked him anything. Because I said, if he's God, he should know anything and God should provide you. Why should you ask something? Um, and he said, no, ask me, what do you want? I said, Swami, I don't want anything. No, you ask me. Chepu, Chepu, Bolo. He tried Telugu, he tried Hindi, he tried English. <laughs> what do you want? I was so scared. The first thing I said, okay, okay, okay. Um, my sister, I just said, because my mother has been now writing to me, hey, you're in Sai Baba's ashram now. <laughs> so now the, their doors were slowly opening up <laughs> and they wanted to sneak in. <laughs> And, but they didn't know where to go with Sai Baba because Sai Baba was a big no-no for them being Lord mm -hmm. Shiva devotees and all. So she, but she had kept writing, you know what, your elder sister has been married for 11 years, she's not had a baby, can you ask Sai Baba? I said, no way, I'm the last person to get up and say, Swami bless my sister with a baby. I thought it was just so, mm -hmm. uh, so, so petty to ask mm -hmm. him uh, because I saw him so keen in his mission and things like that. But he was forcing me that day. I had nothing else to ask. So I just said, Swami, my sister. <laughs> ah, yes, your sister. Less 11 years, 12 years, whole family is crying. No baby, no baby. Really? Your mother, and then he turns around and says, your mother, ayo Muruga, Kaurindal Parakaliye, Kaurindal Parakaliye. He told in Tamil exactly the way my mother would say. From my mother, that was a message from my mother because even if he had said, oh, Bhagawan, oh, God, your mother is saying, it would have been different. He actually said the family deity whom my mother would worship, right? Oh, Muruga, Muruga, your mother is all the time, Muruga, Muruga, Kauranda Parakli, Is this Parakli. the first time maybe that he revealed his omniscience to you? Yeah, that was the first time. For me, it was like, wow. And it was coming so fast, I didn't have time to even <laughs> digest it. He just, he just waited for me to say that. It was as if, like, I need you to say that so that I can get your family in here. You <laughs> nincompoop say that. <laughs> So the moment I said, yes, your sister, she's not had a baby, everybody is crying, your mother is going on doing this, I'll give you Bibuti, you give it to your sister, in nine, eight, nine months, you're, she'll get a baby boy, good. I'm like, wow, and I said, come out of... What do you think your sister might have said? Well, I, I'll come to that in a bit, and the second thing, now what do you want? So you didn't finish it, okay, Niko M. Kavalan, what do you want, what do you want? Swami, I want nothing. So, Chepo. And you know, he's coming so close, big hair, you're Swami. What is this going on here? I don't want anything. But the moment he said, and, and suddenly, it was just always been my desire, and my heartfelt desire, because I wanted to know what does Swami do in his room upstairs. Mm -hmm. I mean, here people are seeing his avatar, he's God, he sleeps, he doesn't sleep, he eat, he doesn't eat, whatever, you know. And I was wanting to know everything firsthand. I, I was, I never, because I had enough of rituals and 
other people's stories. So I wanted to learn firsthand everything about Sai Baba. So the moment he said, what do you want? I said, Swami, I want to be with you in your room. Ah, come tomorrow, come tomorrow morning. It, in a flash of a second, he said, that's all. Vepanunchi Ocha say, come from tomorrow. I was like, wow, Swami, thank you. And I hugged him. He said, hey, you're spoiling my hair. <laughs> so those are the two things. And I walk out of the interview room excited because I'm going to be in Swami's room. I didn't I have no clue what that meant because I knew there were other boys. There were two or three other boys who were actually personal attendants of Swami. Every day. Yes, they would, you know, we would go there in the 4, and 4 did he invite final. you to come just for one day? No, I stayed there with him for two years after that. <laughs> um, I knew you got into that position eventually, but I didn't know it was as a result of that first thing. It was. It, it happened so simply and so sweetly. Because those were, the, in my building blocks of faith was actually in his divine presence, not by reading a book, but actually watching him and seeing him. To, you know, literally almost 24 hours till he would go to his bed and shut the room door. <laughs> but to finish my story, as uh, 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 the story of my sister. So I come out of the interview room oh, yeah. excited because I'm going to go into Baba's room. Uh, and the second part was nervous and, and confused because Baba not only revealed his omniscience about his, my sister's plight, but he also said, I'm going to give you Vibhuti. In eight, nine months, she's going to have a baby boy. So like too many things, first of all, eight or nine months, immediately, it's not like, you know, eventually she'll have a boy. <laughs> he's given the time frame and he's, he says, it's going to be a boy. What if it's a girl? I, I needed that faith so badly at this, that period. I don't, I didn't want to philosophize if it's a girl and make a philosophy of what Baba would have meant. I wanted just, you know, concrete evidence at that point. I said, Baba, you don't have, you don't have to say all those details for me. Now I have to wait eight months to make sure that it comes true. But believe it or not, the timing, and this is what the, the Leela of ba Baba is. Um, you know, those days you had registered mail, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm waiting at the interview room. Anyway, so I'm waiting at the interview room, waiting for Baba to give that vibhuti because my baby, you know, my sister's baby has to come. So obviously it's not going to be like just a packet vibhuti. It's going to materialize for me. Yay! So I'm waiting for that. Baba finishes the interview, and he's handing everybody packets of vibhuti. I'm like, where's that vibhuti coming? You know, the vibhuti, which Baba said. <laughs> He just hands me the packets of Vibhuti and he's carrying on. I'm saying, Swami, Swami, didn't you say my sister? Swami, sister, Vibhuti, I gave you, no? Send this to her. <laughs> it was just an ordinary handing over, you know? So that was my first thing. Like, you don't need any special, uh -huh. oh, for your sister, 11 years, okay, let me prescribe this one. <laughs> the fourth wave. <laughs> it was just the, you know, just send it to her. And for me, that was like, there's no way this is going to work. This is just what he gave everyone else. <laughs> there's no way. So I had no, I had no feeling. I said, oh my gosh, this need not have happened. I should not have asked about this. Because I was just getting there and I don't want this confusion. Anyway, I put it in the mail, write all, my, all these details to my sister, and I mail it to her. Now, the mail takes three or four days to reach Delhi. The day it reached her, that morning, five in the morning, my sister was woken up by Nagar Sangeetan. And so she had also heard about, you know, me being in Baba's college and all that. And she was probably going through this depression phase of not having a baby, and she was really pining for one. So apparently that morning she got up with this Baba's bhajan going past her house. So she got up and she felt like crying to Baba and saying, if you're really God, why don't you hear my prayer? <clears throat> and eight o'clock that morning, she gets the prasadam by mail. So for her... With the vibhuti. See the timing. It's a perfect time. It is not like, you know, she was... Um, every time I speak about Baba, this is what I get. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the timing. He gave me the interview. He made me ask. And he said, mail it. So I mail it. And three days later, she gets up at that time. And she prays. And she, you know, her prayer and the grace had to meet. This extraordinary sequence of events is something I can't get over, you know, and it's, it's everybody's experience at, in some level or the other. It's not coincidence, right? It's coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, so that was it. She gets this um, uh, envelope, she opens it, she finds Baba's Vibhuti and the letter and, and then of course eight months later she had a boy. So she got pregnant. <laughs> she got pregnant <laughs> within a month. She conceived within a month. Whoa. Whoa. One thing after the other. So my parents immediately were like a 180 degree or a 360 degree, whatever turn that 180 was. Degree. 180 degree yeah. turn straight to Baba. 
Well, you know, there was no this, questions this is, asked after this that. This is just a joyous story to share, and I'm, I'm really glad you did because it's just unbelievably beautiful. But then you open this big door also that has to be explored, and it's your fault. You said you had all of this interest in knowing about what goes on upstairs mm -hmm. in Baba's room, and you told him to his face. <laughs> And he said, come up, and then you just got done telling us that you stayed there with him as his attendant for two years. Yeah. Everybody's waiting, Sundar. <laughs> <laughs> what does go on in Baba's house? Well, let me, let me summarize that. <laughs> I, I think what, what, I, what I took home every night was the intensity of Baba and his mission. He was such an intense person. There wasn't, um, I, I would see his life, okay, as is, is a day in Baba's life. You get up in the morning, it's a small room, 10 feet by 10 feet, and the Puttaparthi ashram windows are wid wooden windows above the bhajan hall where he would sleep, and there were four of them, small, four small windows, so you can open each one at a time. He would have just one open and three closed all the time. And in the mornings, he would get up at 4 or 4 o'clock or whatever because he needs to get his hair done for the 6 o'clock darshan. The Suprabhadam girls goes on much later at 5.15 or so. They think they're waking him up, but he's wide awake. He's probably doing his hair. Uh, but he would get up at 4 in the morning. He would not put on his own bedroom light. He would use a flashlight. Why? Because you'd say, if I put on the light, the devotees across in the West Prashanti, they're all waiting for Baba's room light. And they're crazy people. They won't sleep. Then they will all be up at 3 o'clock and they'll be waiting to get a glimpse of my mm -hmm. hair, my face. Why should I trouble them? He would say, I, will, I can take care of my job with my flashlight. Why do I need a big light? <laughs> so in his own room, in his own house, he would use a flashlight to go to the restroom in the morning, have a shower, come out till at 5.15 or 6 o'clock till it becomes brighter, then he would put on his light because then no, you can't make out the difference whether the, you know, the room light is on or off. Beautiful. Um, that, was, that was just the beginning of his day, right? And then he comes out for darshan, he gets people um, in, listens to their problems and solves their issues and just keeps listening to them. Then he, all day long, what does he do? I mean, I used to often wonder, what does he do sitting there? Reading mm -hmm. the devotee's mail. He does that. You know? Oh, that's all he did. That was his pastime, opening, reading, opening, reading, and he would keep some aside. Now, even though he's lived in various houses since the days when you were there, this is his, uh, that I'm aware of now, third one he's living in now, all in same close proximity. Uh, forgive me for, for uh, going a little extra heavy on this, but this is something for posterity. Few people have the opportunity right now or in the future or ever to learn about really <coughs> Uh, Sai Baba in his own personal moments that we can learn from and just what you shared with us is enormously valuable that he's always with his devotees especially with their concerns oh yeah he was what's, what's in that tiny room a bed and a chair and a light and a table is there yeah, anything else it's just the minimum furniture his living room has just one chair for him everybody else stands around him uh, or they sit on the floor and does he hold um, court in there? Are there meetings constantly going on? Is he by himself mostly? What, what well, the, the, the times when I was there, um, the college had just opened, uh, the university was just forming, so you would have the vice chancellor and the registrar, the ashram officials would go up there, the doctor from that small hospital would go up there, and he would make the doctor tell about each and every patient who was there in the hospital. Who is today, who are all visited you? Who are the patients? So you saw me, the stomach ache came, and that leg, one lady came with a broken leg. What, what did you give her? What medicine did you give her? Okay, so he would take out two packets of Vibhuti, give this to that lady. So that would go into Dr. Alreja. He's an old man mm -hmm. now, Dr. Alreja's left pocket. And then he would listen to another patient. He would dig out another two packets or three packets, whatever. And he would say, give this to him. So Dr. Alreja would take that, put it in his right pocket. And then thus it would go on in different pockets. And then one day I asked Dr. Alreja, it's from the same basket. Why are you going on, you know, make, because he would come down later on, make notes mm -hmm. and go. So I asked him, Aap ye kyun kar rahe why are you doing this? Because it's all coming from the same basket Baba has given you. He said, no, <laughs> if Baba has given me two packets and said, this goes to a lady, Those two that has to go. to go only to that lady. <laughs>
That's interesting. So people yeah. who were uh, there because he requested to see them, when he gave instructions, he expected them to carry out the instructions. Oh, to the letter. To the letter. Always. Yeah. Even with us, it was to the letter. He would tell you to do something. You would say, did you meet him or did you just tell somebody to do that? So he would ask, expect us to follow it to the very end, to the very letter. So that was a kind of training he gave us. The, the beauty of that, the, what, I, what I was wanting to say here to summarize the whole thing was uh, his entire life, the way I saw it, was a saga of sacrifice. You know, he was doing it, it's all for his devotee's sake. He had a huge veranda where he could go out for a walk and get some fresh air. He wouldn't do that because devotees would come and watch him. So in his own room, in his own house, he lived like a prisoner. And yet, there was a sense of incredible freedom, peace in his face, in his presence. And to me, that, I was saying, where is that secret? What is that secret that he's, he's not bound by these four walls? I could go crazy. You could give me $10 million and tell me to do this. I, would, I couldn't do it. I would go mad. I would fall for the money, no and doubt. He would do this routine seven days a week, 365 days a year. Without stopping. Quick question for my fourth grade mind, because you gave us a great account of how he knows, he just knows. He know he knew about your sister, he knew about oh, yeah. eleven years with no children, he knew about your mother's anguish over that. And yet you tell us that he reads the letters of his devotees all day. Did it ever dawn on you to ask, Why are you reading these, Baba? Surely you know what's inside these letters, just like you know the contents of my family that you shared with me. Okay, here's the first um um, lesson I learned. Never open your mouth and speak to Swami unless you're spoken to. <laughs> so even though we say we were in his room and we were, oh yeah, we were two years, none of us and no one I knew could ever say, oh yeah, I can put in a word for Baba for you. Nobody. We couldn't, and that's another thing that impressed me, that nobody could say he was close to Baba or take Baba for granted. Even the closest of the closest and not just among students, but among his no. closest attendants as well. Everyone, adults. including the ashram official, whoever, the highest, could never, because when he was with Baba, he was with his mouth shut. Baba would ask him, what is the news? What does so-and-so say? What does so-and-so say? What's news from Canada? Then he opened your mouth and say, oh, what's news from the U.S.? Then he opened your mouth and say, if he is busy reading, you just leave him. Uh, why does Baba read letters? I have no answers. I stopped asking why a long time ago. <laughs> I, I would just stand and watch and observe. Um, I was, um, I was never, um, that, that probably that never crossed my mind because it was such a natural mm -hmm. thing for Baba to just pick up the letters and read. Say, but having said that, let me, let me share one ex uh, exciting uh, or, or an interesting anecdote. Does it have to do with after reading a letter? Yes. Like, yeah, he said one it's day? about reading, about, yes. Yes, reading the letter. Okay, good. Um, and, and the strange thing that Baba would do, just to give you a glimpse of how these personalities are, are incomprehensible. I, I got that also from Baba. Uh, one is his, 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 his physical austerity, if you will, of being focused on his mission, but also a playfulness. Uh, hey, you can't understand me. Just, be, just when you get to know, you think you're getting to know him and his, and his routine, he would throw you off. Here's one. So every day the mail would come and we would arrange it in trays. Okay, the big envelopes, the small, the long ones, and the red ones. We just arrange it properly. It's just easy for him to pick it up instead of being in a mess. So we take the tray and go, and he would open his bedroom in the afternoon, come out, and we would go and leave it just next to him. And if he has something to share, that time he would talk to you, and we would wait uh, just outside his room. We would never stand in his presence unless he would say, okay, sit down and press my feet or something. Otherwise, he would just stay and leave. So that's afternoon, it's just like everyday routine, right? So I just go, leave the trays, and I'm backing out. He says, wait, come here. I said, all right. I go, he takes the tray, keeps it on his lap, and believe me, there, were, there would have been at least 150 or 175 envelopes in that one tray, and there were three trays like that. At a speed of, I don't know, incredible speed, he kept picking up envelopes. One, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven. You're not feeling or anything, you know? Just picking it up at fast, keep it, keep it. Keep it here, keep it, keep it, keep it. I was like, wow, what is this going on? So he's passing one envelope after the other, the big, small, you know. Then 
another tray. Here, take, 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 take. He's like, that day he didn't have time for this. So he gives me, my hand is full of envelopes here. Like I have at least 40 or 50 of them. And then he takes a deep breath and he says, you know what, all this has got something to do with money. So give it to the, give it to Kutum Brown, the person who was in charge. And I'm walking down the stairs thinking, what do you mean all this has got something to do with money? So I went to a smaller room because he would expect us to open it, arrange it and give it to the, you know, Kutum Brown. So we would take anything personal away. And if it's a check or some money involved, we would give it separately. Every single envelope had something from 11 rupees to a $10,000 check. He knew. Every one of them had something to do with money. Every one. <laughs> I couldn't believe. I, did, I told others, hey guys, you don't touch this. This is my stuff. I'm going to do it. They say, yeah, it's all yours. Because Baba gave you, you better do it. So I sat and it took me about 45 minutes to open each one. I was curious. What if one of them was missing? Mm -hmm. There was, every one of them had either some cash, some check, something from the least was 11 rupees. I remember those amounts, and the big, the highest, biggest was a $10,000 check. <laughs> Every one of them, and I was like, wow. So yeah, to answer your question, why does he need to read letters? I don't know. Why does he need to eat? Why does he need to walk? Why does he need to be here just to have fun? I guess. Well, Maya, there's so much to ask, so little time, <laughs> and so many areas to cover here. So let's resume with your part of the story about. Uh, as a student, you also, uh, and then after you were a student, you worked in the hospital there. I'd like to know about that. Yes. I'd like to know about how you and Sundar met. <laughs> and I'd like to know how you and Sundar <laughs> formed this wonderful partnership that's really a dual road partnership, both the marriage and, and great service work. Uh, that is your way of spending the rest of your life in the service of humanity. Mm -hmm. So you begin with the hospital work first. Okay. Well, um, like I was saying earlier that, you know, when Swami started the hospital in 91, um, some of us got letters to volunteer in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, um, While you were students? No, this is, we had finished. Okay, I had finished, finished my graduation okay. right. and I was back home and um, I was planning to do my master's. Mm -hmm. um, but then I got this letter saying, if you want to volunteer um, at the super speciality hospital, come to Puttaparthi. So I just le left everything <laughs> and... Um, this was in December 91. Mm -hmm. I went to Puttaparthi and we were a group of eight girls and um, Swami called us in and told us that the next day we were being sent to Delhi to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and um, we would go there and we'd receive training to work in the hospital. And we had no idea what kind of training and what we were going to be doing, you know, but it was Swami's work so anything was okay. And um, this was winter in Delhi, it was December, and Delhi is really, really cold as compared to Puttaparthi. So Swami, at the end of the interview, looked at us and said, um, he, he actually called one of the Seva dolls, and then he distributed blankets to all of us. And he said, you all are not prepared, Delhi is going to be really cold, so, you know, I'm giving you these blankets, keep warm over there. And he said, your tickets are booked, everything is done, so you go. So the next day, eight of us and um, one of the teachers um, came with us and we were put on a train two days to Delhi. We go there, we were received by the staff of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, taken to the hospital. And there we were told that um, we were given choices and they said we need three girls to work in the ICU. And I must say, not one of the eight of us has a degree in science. <laughs> we were all or either arts or nurses. commerce, no training whatsoever. <laughs> Um, you know, in nursing, and I think the only thing we may have done is cut up frogs in school or something. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Anything to do with science, but um, and they would go have there been dead, and dead frogs. Dead frogs, exactly. <laughs> 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 we had no idea what anything to do with medicine. So we go there. We were told three of three girls had to work in the ICU, and this is all in the cardiac department. Um, and then four of us were to work in the operation theater and one girl for the cath lab, which they call it. So I jumped at the idea of working in the operation theater because it just sounded exciting. So my friend and me and two other girls went there and then we were trained initially as anesthetists. And um, I still remember, you know, they were training us to put in the IV and draw the blood and suddenly I hear this thump and my friend's fallen down, fainted on the floor because she saw blood for the first time. So um, we were there for two months. So the first month was training as anesthetists and the second month um, they shifted us over to assist in the surgery. 
So we had to stand there and give the instruments to the doctors and you know go through, learn right. all the steps of every type of open heart surgery um, and uh, learn what all that. What a baptism of fire. You went right in oh. from nothing yeah. to open heart surgery. To open heart surgery. <laughs> and I remember Dr. Venu Gopal, who was the head uh, chief of staff there at that point, um, one day looked and I was assisting in that surgery. Um, I was under training and he looked and said, um, have you ever held a heart before? <laughs> And I said, no. And he said, you want to feel what it's like? And he called me and he actually, I actually put my hand in and held the person's heart in my hand. It was amazing. <laughs> and we came back from there and then started working. Pursuing your master's at that same time frame, which you could have been doing, huh? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Broaden your but, horizons um, on human yeah. life and your own, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what happened it was then? A, well, we came back from Delhi, and those days the team of doctors from Delhi used to come and work at the Puttaparthi Hospital because mm -hmm. they were still setting up, you know, things over here. Um, so they came back with us, and the training continued. And there were two operation theaters, and um, I think in the two years that I was there, we did about 1,500 open heart surgeries. Good grief! We used to work from seven in the morning to two the next morning, you and then go back again. You know, just exhausting for you. Well, I don't know where we got the energy from. Um, I guess Swami did it, and uh, we were never tired. We would stand, I don't know, nine, ten hours a day continuously. And um, I, my mom, I remember when I called her from Delhi and said, guess where I am? I'm in Delhi the first time that I went for the training, because they had no idea. They thought I'm in Puttaparthi, and the next day I'm gone, and I'm in Delhi, and I call and say I'm here, and you know, this is what I've come for, and I'm being trained. and. She said, are you sure? Can you stand on the blood? And, you know, <laughs> and she says, and, and then they also trained us to um, help because there were, there was, um, you know, less doctors there. Mm -hmm. So with so many surgeries going on, um, they needed help as assistant doctors. So eventually we started doing that, you know, so the <laughs> stitching up towards the end of the surgery and all that. We started doing that. So my mom calls it's and she amazing. says, you only used to do embroidery and now you're doing this, <laughs> you know. It's all the same. <laughs> but it's all the same. <laughs> So, but the best part was that Swami used to come uh, uh -huh. to the hospital and he used to watch the surgeries he sometimes and he would scrub up. Yeah, he, he, used, he said, these are the rules, you know, you don't enter an operation theater so, without so wearing. So he would, would wear, the, he would scrub and he would wear, of course, the cap wouldn't fit his head, <laughs> so he would just keep it on. But he would wear the mask and he'd wear the robe. Amazing, these um, are great insights. He used insights. to follow that and he used great, to come great, in. Great, wonderful insights people yeah, are going was, to love as it much It was as beautiful. So, um, how did you meet Sundar? Huh. <laughs> well, um, Sundar, I was working in the hospital um, mm -hmm. and Sundar was already there. He was teaching in the college and um, our families, his, his parents and my dad's family, they've known each other from Bombay days, so, you know, they're all very close together. So we kind of knew, um, oh, that later, yeah. yeah. So, um, um, I mean, we knew of each other, but we'd never mm -hmm. met being in Puttaparthi. And, um, sorry, what, when was that? That the was later though, right? Yeah, um, that's how you got to, you, you had an idea, but you didn't, you didn't know that that was happening, right? Till <coughs> you know, who's Maya? Oh, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, this was, I guess, in um, June 92. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in April, Sundar's father had passed away, mm -hmm. and I'll let him tell you that part of it. But we were sitting in Darshan. We had gone from the, you know, the hospital staff. We were sitting, and suddenly um, Swami came out, and there was this girl. It was her birthday, one of the girls. And so she stood up with her tray of candy, and Swami looked at her, and he says, Are you Maya? <laughs> and she looked, and she says, uh, No, Swami, I am. And she told her name. and. Um, <laughs> Then he looked around, of course, he blessed her and took her candy, and then he looks and he says, where's Maya? <laughs> and I was scared. I said, what did I do? Why is he asking for me? Because he's never done that before, right? So, so I stood up. I was like in the third or fourth row, and I stood up and I said, Swami, I'm Maya. And then he looks at me and he says, oh, marriage mangta hai, which means marriage you want to get married. <laughs> <laughs> and when we joined the hospital, one of the... Um, one of the conditions now. was, uh, right, but one of the conditions when we joined the hospital, I remember they told our parents that for the next five years you will not get these girls married, you know, mm -hmm. you'll not get your daughter so married, you wouldn't talk of that. Yeah. And I'd only been in the hospital for a year then. <laughs> and I was like, no, Swami, I don't want to get married, <laughs> you know, I'm working. 
But then later I got to know that he had just spoken to Sundar's mom and told her that now, you know, um, you need to get your son married, you're alone, you need to get your son married. And I've seen a girl, she works in the hospital, you know, she's your same a year and all that. Bob was saying that to Sundar's mom. Yeah, she, he had already said that to his mom. And then he comes out afterwards and the next day or something, I think in Darshan, he looks at me and says, oh, you want to get married? And I was like, no, I don't want to get married. And then my parents later told me this part of the story. So, so how, how much time passed and, before uh, all this came to be when you had a chance then to meet Sundar and uh, decide that your fate was already sealed by Baba? Well, um, he had spoken to Sundar's mom in June of 92 and then he asked her to call um, my parents and, you know, he said that um, now because his father was not there, he said, I'm, I'm going to, we are, you know, the boy's side, so I'm going to do everything. So the girl's parents should come and ask for the mm -hmm. boy's hand in marriage. And um, in July, I think my parents had gone, he, Swami was in Brindavan at that time. Mm -hmm. So they had gone there, but then he looked at them and said that, you know, July to August, there's this month um, in the Indian calendar where no one talks of marriage or any, you know, functions like that, nothing auspicious. So he looked and said, this is the Adi Masam, so we won't talk now. You come after this and see me. So August, they came to Puttaparthi when that month got over. And August 18th, he gave my parents and um, Sundar's mom an interview and finalized the wedding. And then he sat with a calendar and said, oh, let's look at the date. And he said, um, first he said September 3rd. And then he said, no, it's a, it's a Thursday. It's a working day, you know. Uh, it won't work out. And then he said, September 6th is a Sunday. So let's do it on September 6th. And, and he and that's married how, the two of you. He married the two of us in the interview room. That's just wonderful. He did and, that. and real quickly, uh, um, it's been a wonderful marriage. You have two yes. beautiful dogs. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you have, and you have a very enterprising uh, future program that you're already sinking your teeth into yes. that will really benefit people all over, not just locally, the people you directly contact, but you'll be really setting an example for others to follow in your footsteps. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of words from you first about that, and then I'd like to talk <laughs> to Sundar also about that. Okay. Well, um... This is, um, both of us have been into yoga, but Sundar is who got me into yoga. It's, it was his passion always, and he'll tell you about that. But when we got married, the first, one of the first questions he asked me is, um, have you done yoga and you like, do you like it? And I said, I did a little bit in college, you know, and it did seem interesting. I think I'd like to get into it. And of course, the first thing he made me do was a handstand. And then he left me there, and I was like, don't leave me, you know. And then suddenly I hear his voice at the other end of the room and I started crying and I said, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then um, he taught me yoga and I started, I, I loved it and I still do. And this is what we want to get out to the community and everybody and the, the, the true meaning of yoga and, you know, not just as a fitness exercise, but bring out this mind, body, spirit aspect of it and bring this out to everybody and that's what we're working on together. And you have and, a virtual um, studio in your own home. We do. You've been to the Himalayas. Yes. You've done videos, <laughs> website information. We're learning everything as we go along, but and, we're trying and, to do it together. And in and, a nutshell, um, what can people learn from that that will help them, whether they have a background in yoga or not, mm -hmm. that will help them um, make better sense of their life and bring some calmness and love that's missing to their life? Yoga basically does that. It, you know, um, it, it's a very, it's a very subtle way that it brings about. You, you do the exercises, but the, the way you focus on each part of your body and your breath, um, it helps you calm down. It helps the stress. It helps stress relief. So automatically, as you're doing this, you start feeling the difference, and, and that would help. And I want to ask you so, what I ask um, just about everybody: mm -hmm. Who is Sai Baba? <laughs> to me, Sai Baba is um, the greatest teacher of all and a very loving friend. That's what I would say. Is he with you always? Yes, always. How far away is he? Not far at all. He's in here. <laughs> always. Maya, thank you. And here's uh, 
the Mangala Sutra that I want Sundar to explain that Baba actually materialized? Yes, at the, at the, uh, at the wedding mm -hmm. uh, in his room when, when the time came. And he said, hey, so where is the um, Mangala Sutra? Where is the, uh, we, in the Tamil we call it Tali, T-A-L-I, mm -hmm. or Mangal Sutra. Is Mangal means auspicious and Sutra means thread. Um, and where is, so where is it? And Maya's mother was like, okay, what do we do? She had one, uh, she had bought to be blessed for her sisters. Uh, wedding was also fixed at that time. So, but Swami said, hang on. And he waved his hand and materialized the uh, tali. It was uh, on a thread which was with turmeric powder, which is again a symbol of auspiciousness. It symbolizes gold. Uh, so the poor could not afford gold, so they take yellow powder and put it on a on a regular thread, so it looks like gold. So he had it on a thread, and he told me to tie it around her neck, um, and he helped me tie the knot. Oh, how beautiful! Because in in our tradition, I tie one knot. The the bride bridegroom tries. I'm bad at these traditions. The bridegroom tries one knot, and his sister, if he has, they tie the other two knots. In meaning that the girl doesn't just get married to him, but his whole family is now, <laughs> she gets bound yeah. to the family, things like that. How beautiful. But anyway, but in this case, it was, I tied a knot and then Swami brought his hand in and worked with me to tie the other two. I thought that was a special blessing. Swami blessed the two of you so much. It was uh, a very special thing and, and we, uh, we are very honored that he took the time to do that for us. So this begins another chapter in, in your life, Sundar, and in the life for two of you, but before we get into it real quickly, uh, wrap up the previous chapter a little bit more for us. You spent two years attending the Baba along with other students? Yes. In his room? Yes. And uh, I, I wish I could ask you 300 questions about that, but what might you add to the picture that we haven't discussed already that might give people who will never know what it's like to see the, the really the, the private abode, yeah. the most private place for Baba. All that I want, all that I, w I want to share, mm -hmm. and, and I'm very eager to tell people is, hey, listen, um, especially because today on the websites, if you type Sai Baba, you get 200 things of people against Sai Baba for no reason at all. And well, there are 10 websites for him. And I, I, and I feel those people who are writing against him have had n no exposure Mm -hmm. Nowhere close to what we have had the exposure. And my heart goes out to just tell people, hey, listen, if you want to really know about Sai Baba, then come to us, you know, come to mm -hmm. me, ask me. I watched him <laughs> 24 into 7, 365 days a year. I was a teenager. I was struggling to find faith, and I found faith by watching him, not by reading a book, not because Vibhuti materialized in some photograph. That would have scared the heck out of me, probably. But this was, I noticed, I saw what Baba was. And, and that's the thing I want to emphasize is he he was all that I know of him was he was he was totally involved in his mission um, you somebody might you know if you're really so atheistic about this whole thing uh, or what do you call that antagonist you might say it's delusional but what a great way to be deluded <laughs> he believed he had a mission he believed he uh, that's why I tell people it does it's our good fortune that we chose to believe he is divine but it doesn't make any difference for him because he believed he was divine that's it he believed he was divine he believed his touch was important his word was important he believed every step he took was had a meaning to it he believed it I saw that in first hand he wouldn't waste a word he wouldn't waste a touch or a look because he was in the moment he knew exactly whom he was looking whom he was talking to what what movements he was making and I can tell you so many incidents pointing to each one of these um, but we don't have time for that. But the, the point is he believed he was divine and he believed he had the mission. Once he was having temperature, right, you know, fever. Mm -hmm. And one of us, we were pressing his feet and we found that he was, you know, uh, stuffed nose. But all this disappears when he goes for darshan, okay. Nobody in the darshan line would even get an iota. He would come back and his eyes will be red and he'll be, you know, uh, stuffed nose. But once he steps out, it'll be like, what? Baba had a cold? There was no way. He was so... <laughs> So that's a whole different thing when he steps out. But that afternoon, he was having a cold, and the other boy said, Swami, please take rest. And he almost immediately said, look at the clock behind you. And we turned. He said, which of those hands are very important? 
So obviously the biggest one, right? We said, Swami, the R hand, he shook his hand. He said, the second hand. You can hardly see it. The second has, hand has to keep moving so that the minute and the R hand will move. He said, I am the second hand. I cannot stop. Jeez, never heard that one before. Tick, 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 tick. Satya, Dharma, Shanti, Prema. Satya, Dharma, Shanti, Prema. I will not stop. Na kekada rest, na rest ledo. He was <coughs> very serious at that time. And the lasting lesson you took away from that once in a lifetime, once in a million experience of spending two years at his side? Incredible determination. Unshakable faith in yourself and clarity of vision. His clarity of vision was amazing. When the super specialty hospital was designed, we were in Kodaikana, and he had the top most engineers, the top notch engineers from Larsen and Tubro, along with Colonel Jogarao. They're coming up with this blue di blueprint of the design of the hospital, so laid out in front of the di on the dining table for Baba to come and watch. Baba's coming down the stairs. Here's the eighth grader, right? Eighth grade pass, so he didn't pass. He threw his books. I wish I could do that. <coughs> He's walking down the steps. Now, what would somebody like that do? Come and watch the design and engage the engineers in some constructive criticism. He's walking past. He comes 10 feet away from the dining table. He gives one glimpse at it. He says, Bagledu, it's not good. And he goes out for darshan. The top engineers, right? None of them are devotees. They're all waiting to be praised because none of them. <laughs> and here is one holy man walking past, not even coming and looking at it and saying, okay, what is this? What is that? He's walking past. He just took one glimpse. He said, Bagledu. Uh, the building, it's not a temple, it's just a building. I want a temple. He said and walked away. And we were all stunned. I said, where did this come from? So the amount, of, because he had a vision. And just one glimpse at that blueprint said, this is not what I wanted. There was no compromising. He never compromised, and he doesn't, I'm sure, on who he was, what he believed in. It didn't matter. Not everybody who came to him stayed to be a devotee, right? It doesn't matter. He never compromised on who he was because he knew he was divine. Hmm. And he would tell us, whatever I'm doing, trust me, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for your good. If you have that faith, you'll benefit by it. It, that is something which I can never forget. So, Cinder, in the remaining moments that we have, just a few of them, you took that lesson, you took that vision, and you brought it to America with Maya. The <laughs> two of you combined efforts, and your love and your desire to serve humanity, uh, and to go <coughs> above and beyond your mere careers, which were rewarding and are rewarding by themselves, to serve humanity in your own distinctive way. We heard a little bit about it from Maya. Fill in some of the details. What's your vision of what you two hope to accomplish? Well, having lived with a master who had such, I mean, a grandmaster, who, and, and watching him serve selflessly, uh, willing to give himself all the time, even if we can achieve an iota of what he has done, I would consider our lives being blessed. Um, once Baba asked, what do you want? And I said, I want to be like you. He shook his head. He said, I am the guru. You be a friend. You don't be a guru like me. Be a friend. And for me, that I, I take that home today because he wants us to be mixed in the, into the society. Be like everyone else, you know and then share the ethics, the values, the principles, uh, and most importantly, the faith that we are inherently divine. And that is an, an infinite potential within us. For me, the path of yoga has been an amazing path of self-discovery, uh, self-enlightenment, self-awakening, if you will. And Baba has guided me in so many innumerable ways. And all those saints and sages and yogis who would come to see him, I would chase them and learn uh, advanced practices from them. And Baba, in his own way, would guide me. And the very fact that he blessed me with a medal for the convocation, out of the blue, he said, call Sundar and call him to the stage, too. I was like, why? And, you know, he said, this is for your yoga. And he gave me the medal. He did. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, so he recognized your he yoga recognized my pursuits yes. back when you oh, were yes. just yes. culminating your student days. Yes. And there were always, and many times, there was one or two occasions when there would be, when he would call these Buddhist monks for interview, he would pick me and he say, hey, mad fellow, you also like all this, you also come. Uh, and I remember one where I didn't understand a word of what Baba was talking to them. And they were all, oh, wait, wait, hang on. Baba was talking to them in Telugu and to me in Telugu. These are two Buddhist monks sitting, amazingly erect, just staring at Swami. And he's talking to them in Telugu from Tibet. From Tibet. They're Tibet, okay? They're not uh, regular. Um, so I knew they wouldn't understand Telugu, the language, right? India has so many mm -hmm. different, completely different languages. Baba is talking flawlessly to them in Telugu. He's talking to me in Telugu. This is going on for 45 minutes. And I'm thinking, I'm listening to Baba. It's amazing. His exposition on Kundalini was amazing. Um, but he was talking for 45 minutes. But at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, I'm gifted. But what are these two even <laughs> understanding? But then I'm finding their eyes watering and they are just seated deep in meditation. So after the interview was over, I, I met them after the bhajans and everything in the evening. I said, Namaste. And they said, oh, yes, Namaste. And I said, uh, in Hindi, did you understand anything? With great difficulty, because they didn't even understand that, I guess. Um, and they said, oh, Baba spoke so beautifully about Kundalini. Really? And he's explained it so well. Everything that we experienced was... So they heard it in his, their own I don't language. know. I don't know what, I mean... When he says language of the heart, <laughs> honestly, I'm telling you, those are the times I would spend the whole night sleepless thinking, what happened tonight? <laughs> what was going on there? How could it, this even be possible? But it was, it was. And I, I, I was first-hand witness to that, that one particular incident. But, but Swami, in his own way, it guided me. So, you know, it, it's benefited me, uh, enriched my life, health-wise, uh, spiritual, you know, wise, when I see people of my age stressing out, falling sick for no reason at all, for little things that could upset them, you know, the balance, the equilibrium, if you will, I owe it all to this wonderful science of yoga. And, and, and I'm so happy that Maya is with me. And she's probably the best gift um, Baba has ever given me. And she's, she's a strength behind it. And all, now, honestly. Now you want to both pass this on because <laughs> you've been gifted with it yes. from the, 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 the Supreme Master. And, and it's our way of bringing Swami in to, into the lives of people. Mm -hmm. I think Swami says, your life is my message. So instead of telling people who Sai Baba is, if you live it, and they ask you, who was this master you're talking about? It was strange. We did a yoga workshop, and we talked about it. And they said, so where did you study again? And then I mentioned Sai Baba. And then this American lady says, oh, is he the one who sells these uh, incense, incense sticks? <laughs> because Sai Baba incense. I said, well, his name is there. He doesn't sell incense sticks. <laughs> Why wouldn't? But his name is there. I said, all right. So they, so they start from there. And we ended up another two hours just talking about Swami. So there was this 18 people sitting who had no clue. And they had heard about Sai Baba. But now they're getting to know Sai Baba. So it's, it, I feel very honored to do that. And we feel very... Uh, it's a very self-fulfilling uh, task. Let's conclude with two uh, easy questions. And one is uh, the name of your program and how people can access it on the web. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, well, we have a website called ayerzone.com. Swami used to always call me Ayer, and I never like it because by the time I was 16, that's my last name, I Ayer, and that's that's like sig putting my cast out there. And um, Ayer is usually called priests are called Ayer, mm -hmm. you know the pot-bellied priest. So for me, the Iyer concert, oh, well, don't call me Iyer. My name is Sundar. But Swami, hey, Iyer, hey, Iyer, always. <laughs> but then when we were talking about this program, and I said, there must be somewhere, some meaning. What do we, we name this? Uh, suddenly it dawned on me that I-Y-E-R can be abbreviation for integrated yoga exercise routine. Very good. Say that one more time. I-Y-E-R is an abbreviation for integrated yoga okay. exercise routine. Wonderful. So, so I bring in the mind, body, spirit, exercise for the mind, exercise for the and body, sure exercise no for the spirit. you put that to a website name as well. Yes, yeah, so Ayer, Ayer Zone is the zone of integrated yoga exercise routine. I'm, 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 we just started, we learned to program a website. We're, we're doing it all by ourselves, so it's taking one step at a time with two full-time jobs. But we are getting there. We hope to uh, put, uh, you know, share yoga blogs, yoga exercises. I have been invited to do yoga workshops in a few places um, in and around Cleveland now, especially. So we are very excited. 
that we are able to reach out a program for the seniors. We are coming up with a program for the Bakai community. I want to make yoga affordable. It's unfortunately taken to the Hollywood style. Everybody is afraid to talk about spirit. Don't be afraid. You can't, you can't talk about yoga and not talk about the spirit. You can't say there's a physical yoga and a mental yoga. Somebody asked me, is your yoga physical or is it spiritual? I said, you tell me where the body ends and the mind begins. Where does the mind end and where the spirit begins? You tell me what, where, where are these compartments and I'll tell you what my yoga is. Good where answer. does it end? Good answer. And what's the name of the website if people want to get information right now? It's IYERZONE.COM. IYERZONE.COM. Dot com. And I want to thank both of you. And I'll, I'll ask uh, Sundar one final question. We hear where Baba played a, an important part in Maya's life from the age of four, how he lulled you into his university and into being uh, an attendant to him. Uh, what's the future of Baba in your life? And I ask this because he's not sharing from his lips as much as he once did to <coughs> all of us. He's sharing in another way. What's Sai Baba's role for you in your future? His role has, has progressed from being a Swami to being Sai. And by that I mean there was an attachment to the form and, and and a relationship with the Guru and that's materialized and matured into an inherent principle, divinity principle itself that's, that's awakened and guiding me every moment in my life. I, I look to it for inspiration. I, I feel Swami so much within me, I mean this home, this wherever we live, uh, that I've, I haven't been to Puttaparthi for 15 years, nor as Maya. The desire has not come for two reasons. One and both are very personal. One being that I've not felt the need because why do I need to go when, I, when you experience His divinity in everything that we do, the birds chirping, the plants, the trees, the good and the bad. It's, it's amazing how you, when you open yourself and allow divinity to express itself within from within, it's, the proximity is so mind-blowing that you feel going there is just something uh, you don't want to. The other reason why I really don't want to go is I can't see Swami in a wheelchair. I'm not seeing it that way. <laughs> Beautiful. Cinder, Maya, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you both opened your hearts and shared as much as you have, and I have a feeling this is just scratching the surface. So until the next time, let me just say, God bless you, thank you both, and Sai Ram. Sai Ram. Sylvia, one evening, um, he's sitting, spent the whole day, and usually he has a down in his, inside his 10 feet room, he'll be going up and down. <laughs> Reading for okay, Swami, okay. So you got to go. <laughs> for what? Just to make sure you guys are safe, right? <laughs> um, that's why he says.